Folks, this episode is brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant takes the money ball approach to the sport of wrestling. They have an app that's available on the Google and Apple Play stores where you can find all of their Division One wrestling data. They track 500 plus stats for each match, timestamp them, and then upload them into the Quant app. Really fantastic tool. Download it now at Quant Wrestling. On the Google and Apple Play stores, use the discount code WCML to get your first month free. So there's only two guys that, that wrestled at Iowa State, and I went to coach at Iowa. It was myself and Gable. So I'm, I'm <laughs> waiting on my I'm waiting on my presidential medal. We can endure anything, and adapt, and pivot, and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy we're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's it's five percent of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. It's Thursday, February 24th. We're getting ever so close to conference weekend in the D1 season. Not this weekend, but next weekend. Big 10s, Big 12s, all the action gets underway. Cannot wait to watch it unfold. In the meantime, have a new episode for you. We have Kurt Backus. Kurt was a two-time All-American for the Iowa State Cyclones, where he was coached by both Bobby Douglas, the great Bobby D, and Cale Sanderson. He was an NCAA finalist as a senior. After that, he went to coach for Mizzou, Virginia Tech, and the Iowa Hawkeyes, making he and Dan Gable the only two former Cyclones to go on to coach at the University of Iowa. I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do as well. Fan of the Week goes to... Got it right here. Pulling up the gram. Kyle Bergman. That's at Kyle Bergman. Two ends on the gram. He says ambition is the path to success. Persistence is what takes you there. I love it, Kyle. He's an Iowa fan, a listener of this show. Godspeed, my friend. Last but not least, this episode's presented by Quant Wrestling. Download the Quant Wrestling app now in the Apple and Google Play stores. If you love this show, use our discount code WCML. To get your first month free. Quant Wrestling, download it now. And without further ado, let's give it up for Kurt Backus. Ready if you are, Kurt. Yeah, no, Iowa State being back in the top five, I mean, that, that's, that's where I want them to be, uh, being a, you know, ex-cyclone and alumni. Uh, when I graduated, we were runner-up, and then so I think obviously before that we were always in the top ten right there. I mean Bobby Douglas, if it wasn't for Iowa, I mean would have been you know he, I don't know how many times he took second. Right. Uh, I think had to have probably taken second five or six times when, when um, the Hawkeyes won it. So we we're always right there. I mean Iowa State being in a, you know in a mix top five scrapping. It, it's definitely a good place to be, and that's where they should be. I mean for the state, you know you and I, Iowa State, Iowa. I mean it's. You go to any of those three duels, right? Um, it's electric. Electric. And like we were saying before we got on air, you're a Jersey guy. I'm an Illinois guy. We like to think our wrestling's good, and it is. But the atmosphere and support for wrestling in Iowa is just like second to none. I mean, look at that Iowa State U and I duel. The place was yeah. insane. Yeah, they were saying, uh, well, the McLeod Center um, will be the new west gym i mean obviously west gym is a tough tough place to coach and compete in i mean a place is like it's you know a high school gym it's hot old those old radiators that clicking and popping they're 
90 some degrees you can't touch them because they're hotter than all hell and um but the mcleod center yeah i mean iowa state and iowa they packed it or i'm sorry iowa state you and i i mean they they, they packed the stands that it was it was good to see and what schwab is doing up there i mean it, yeah he's he's doing the right things and doing it the right way got a good philosophy it, it's good to see yeah i love those guys doug schwab's one of my favorites and you know, I've never been to a meet in West Gym, so I don't have the same nostalgia for it. But I look at duels in like the McLeod Center, or even out at um, what I can't think of the name of the Penn State gym, uh, the main Rec one, Hall, right? not Rec, Rec Hall, Hall, but the uh, oh, um, Bryce yeah, Jordan. Bryce Jordan, yeah, Bryce but man, Jordan. you yeah. watch a duel in there, and I know people like love yeah. uh, love Rec Hall, but it's like, dude, that looks like a, like a D one basketball game, you know, and like the McLeod yeah. Center is a step up from the West Gym. I know it's not, but in my mind, it is. It just it's a whole new presentation for the team. Yeah, I mean, be, being an athlete, you know, right? I think nowadays it, it is all about the glitz and glamour, right? Having the top things, you know, big gym, wrestling in front of you know the five seven thousand fans, you know, every dual meet, and what they put on in the McLeod Center is is what you want to see. You know, being a fan, a coach, and an athlete, that's what you want to see every time you go out there. You know, place was rocking. You know, electric. It was it was good. You know, Bryce, you know, well, Bryce Jordan, I mean, that place, yeah, I mean, Penn State packs it. I mean, the, yeah. the whiteout, tough place to wrestle in. It looks incredible. I know you had some duels against Penn State back in your your heyday. What was it like, uh, dual meets at Blair Academy back in the day? Were you guys getting anyone coming in there? The thing about us, we, we are road warriors. We would go, I mean, very rarely. So the people that would come to us uh, were St. Ed's. Um, we had Parkland and everyone outside of that were just obviously at just the other prep schools. Um, but we would go, nobody would really want to come to us. You know, a lot of the, you know, Lehigh Valley teams, we would go there. It's like, we wrestle you, but you got to come to our gym. And then they would try to, you know, think of us coming there, or they're going to have a big advantage, but you know, it just obviously didn't come out to that. <laughs> It was, it was hostile. I remember going to, you know, I'm going to keep the name out of it, going to some of the Lehigh Valley high schools. We would leave, you know, we would be five, six of us. We'd go and kind of uh, scout. Right. And we would leave. They would be throwing rocks and, and snowballs at us because they hated us. It was just, yeah, Lehigh Valley is a hostile place, you know, tough place to wrestle. They love the wrestling too. And it was, yeah, they just, you know, obviously you win so much, they hate you. Right. And so, so were you guys going up against like the public schools in Lehigh Valley or was like the St. Ed's and the St. Paris Grams of the world, your biggest rivals? Yeah. So our biggest rivals coming up was obviously St. Ed's. We beat them my junior year. We're number one. It was there in, uh, in Cleveland or Lakewood. Um, the other team was Easton always was tough. Um, Parkland was always tough, you know, with like when Trench was there, um, but yeah, I mean, re usually those those three schools. It was you know the Parkland, Easton, St. Ed's, um, St. You know uh, St. Um, St. Paris Graham wasn't good yet, um, and you know those are kind of the main guys. You know we would go there and travel, and it was tough, tough sledding. You know we go to Ironman every year. You know Beast of the East. They had this Liberty tournament in Bethlehem, and it was that was tough. It was you know they they were um, you know they they didn't like. Uh, the prep schools coming in to wrestle them. <laughs> and that that topic is still as relevant as ever i mean right now one of the best middle schools in the in the country is sideline from wrestling Bo at the state tournament bo bassett and uh yeah. you know even in illinois it's always a debate you know the the privates versus the publics the recruiting right. et cetera, et cetera. but you know blair academy back then was an exception to the rule really one of the first national teams and you guys had some studs on your squad i mean yeah it was, um, I mean, I think it was 2000 and 2001 team, right? It was, you know, I, again, I, I probably missed quite a few of them, but when you have a team full of like, say, Corey Cooperman, uh, Mark Perry, Hudson Taylor, uh, me, Steve Mako, Zach Esposito, I mean, that's five, six guys right there that are putting up big points, right? And then we have a ton of guys that Robbie Preston went to Harvard, all American, I believe. I mean, all these guys that were, were tough. Matt Veers, another one who's coaching at Notre Dame, um, mm -hmm. down in, uh, uh, Lehigh Valley, all these kids that were, you know, all around there, you know, 
wanted to win. And when you have a Blair Academy, that's an hour from your house. It's tough to kind of, you know, say no or stay away. I mean, I was never recruited, right? I mean, say what you want, Jeff Buxton, we, he never like came to me and said, Hey, you want to come wrestle Blair? I heard about him because I believe it was the 96, 97 team it was like Sean Gray, Quinn Foster, um, Jason Silverson. That was a team that won their first national title in high school. And I was like, Holy cow, man, Blair Academy, never heard of them. Hour for hour from my house in New Jersey, right. Um, up in Blairstown, New Jersey, you went up there. It's, 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 it's heaven, right? I mean, the, the room there, um, it's a prep school. So top education, all you're doing is going to school and, and wrestling, you know, it's a tough, tough, not to even think about it to be, if that's what you want to do as a kid. Yeah, so it's pretty neat. And so you hear about it, you go up there on a visit. I'm guessing it was one of those beautiful fall days and it was just immaculate and you meet Buxton. I mean, how did, how does it go from that to, to committing and, and did you live there? Yeah, it was uh, it's a boarding school. So you're there. So how it works, it's you go, uh, school is uh, Monday through Saturday. And it's a half day Wednesday and half day Saturday. So, you, I mean, all you're doing, you're going to school, right? You got five, six, seven blocks of classes. And then, uh, yeah, practicing three o'clock till dinner at six. And so it's, yeah, you go up there. You can choose to do other sports, right? They highly advise you to. So you can play soccer, football, baseball. But usually, yeah, it's like a two-sport athlete, you go up there, wrestle, you know, do freestyle in the spring. Um, I mean, it's co-ed, right? It's not just go up there, you, just, you know, all you're doing is just – you have some girls to talk to, right? I mean, academics are tough. So it, it's a good um, prep, right? It's a prep school for college. So the, the volume of, of school you're doing and the volume of wrestling you're doing, you get to college, it's like, oh, this is – I've done this. I've been there. You know, I've – I've traveled and and done the, you know, wrestling tournament every weekend, learning how to handle academics. So you get to college, you're now overwhelmed. Right. I would think some of those academic courses at Blair might even be tougher than college courses. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, they have a lot of AP, AP courses. Um, I mean, you can, you can skate around, right. You can skate through and, and try not to um, excel, but I mean, yeah, they, they highly advise you to take tougher classes and get you prepared for, for college. I mean, really you got the choice of any school you want to go to. Right. I mean, especially when you layer on your wrestling accolades, three-time beast, uh, three-time Ironman champ, you know, three-time prep champ on, like you said, one of the most notorious teams in high school wrestling. When you look at Buxton's style and his philosophy, you've been around some great coaches, dresser, the brains brothers, Bobby Douglas. Yep. And Kale, obviously, how can we forget Kale? Where does Buxton Kale, fit? Yep, is is yep. he more of like a like a hard ass type? Is he more of like a gratitude type? Where do you put him on that scale? Uh, Buxton was a a student of the game, right? He he, he surrounded himself with with top assistants, right? Uh, Solomon Fleckman, uh, Lehigh guy, he was an All American there, uh, great technician. Um, uh, uh, Nate Burrows went to Brown, who's also maybe around of um, around a twelve. So he, uh, Wayne Caton, another guy, he wrestled at Syracuse, you know, all American up there. Well, a couple of time runner up actually. Two time so runner he, up. Yeah. Two time runner up. So he surrounded himself with people that had a wealth of knowledge. And so he, he really leveraged people around him to, you know, help him, um, bring along other guys. So he was a student of the game, knew what it took to, you know, get the technique in there. Uh, wasn't afraid to ask for help from, say, parents or other people. Um, he did things differently. I mean, I remember in, in high school, we, we would be pushing around this big 300-pound buoy, right, that you see in the ocean. <laughs> and, like, you just push it around. We'd throw 100-pound we'd throw stones. Um, we had, you know, uh, um, ropes in the room, um, horizontal and, and vertical ropes that we were climbing. So we, I mean, nothing that is like, you know, new nowadays, but maybe 20 years ago, it was a little bit different, right? A little bit wacky, but he was just, wasn't afraid to do things differently. Um, so we can have that little edge. Would you guys do the ropes like on a weekly basis or <clears throat> oh, every day? Every really? day. Yeah. We, we, would, I mean, every, um, we have them in, in the woods, you know, on, on campus, but we also have, you know, four or five vertical ropes and then a horizontal rope in the room and then it's, it's all the way across the room. I mean, what is it? 
50 feet, 60 feet across. So I mean, but you know, you're doing it five, six times, you know, it's your hands are burning, you know, you try not to fall after, you know, a two hour practice. So it's just, you know, we had that, um, that strength, right. That, that hand strength and, and, um, the ability to just to hold on, right. Um, just to keep going. Yeah. The more I get into like strength and fitness as a, as a 30 year old adult, I'm looking at uh, well, I'm 32, but in my thirties, you know, I'm looking yeah, oh, at, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the basic stuff like rope climbs, pull-ups, body yeah. weight squats. Like I love that, that stuff, you know, big in Dagestan and Oseti, obviously yeah. in certain programs back in the day were adopting it. Whereas I was doing like incline bench press in high school and I didn't know what the hell yeah. I was doing it for, you know? No, I'm, I'm big into like the, the non-traditional lifts. Right. I mean, if you can't climb a rope as a wrestler, well, you got other issues to worry about, right? I mean, you should be able to climb a rope without without feet, you know, if you want to win a state title. So, I mean, stuff like that, it's like non-traditional stuff that's going to make you work, right? Go go outside, go find a, a, a big boulder, right? I mean, try to lift in like a Kurillin, right? <laughs> Hear stories about that, that freak. That guy was in Siberia throwing whatever he could around. Yeah. so just you know it's not just like oh i'm gonna go and do a 300 pound bench because when are you just gonna be doing benching somebody you know it's a, it's like that um a different type of strength where you gotta throw somebody guy or girl you know on their head right it's gonna take that you know non-traditional lifting yeah um in, into into place so it's and i think strength and conditioning coaches are doing better right it's like dinosaur training you know just to okay how, how can we you get this, you know, guy or girl moving, um, to where, you know, with wrestling, it's not, it's not, you're just not isometric, right. It's all different muscles, different part of the body that you got to use, right. Yeah. You, there's parts of the body in wrestling that you don't even know you had that restore. So how, how <laughs> can we, you know, how can we get those muscles going and, and different, uh, different facets, you know? Yeah. And, and I love that Buxton was on top of that stuff back then. And it's probably why one of the main reasons they were so, so successful. The other two stories I love from, from that room. And you can let me know if you were a part of these one Buxton wouldn't open the door until practice was to begin. Like he wouldn't let guys come in and get their shoes tied. Like you had to be ready to go before it started. Is that true? I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's true. No, because we obviously come in and, and, and get ready. No, I mean, that was never a time where the door was locked. Um, you know, we'd come in and right when it, you know, three thirty right at starts, it's we're we're rolling. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's ever a time that the door was closed. Um, maybe after me, and not not before me. So yeah, it was always at three thirty. You know, you find a spot in the wall, get your, your shoes ready, you got your water bottle, and you're going. And then the other one was uh, like the equivalent of like human cockfighting on the ropes. Like you guys would have uh, some oh, yeah. idols hanging up there. Yeah, we had um these pugil sticks where we had um football uh football helmets and these pugil sticks that we would use sometimes and yeah i mean any any i mean my freshman year we were boxing and uh <laughs> yeah, we just kicked the crap out of each other so you know again maybe nowadays it's, it's grounded upon but yeah just different ways to find that toughness right um but yeah on the rope i mean we'd be climbing rope one at a time going to the top dang so yeah, different uh, ways to different ways to get up there yeah that's that's good stuff right there how big well, of a change was it for you to get under uh the great bobby douglas at iowa state and that preseason oh, I mean, workout no oh, yeah there was again bobby douglas was good um he would say i forgot more than you know <laughs> right? i mean the the guy again he he was one of those guys where technically one of the most technical guys i've ever met uh, coaching wise i mean you couldn't stump him right about hey i i, I learned this he's like oh, i learned that when i was you know 12 years old right <laughs> so yeah his preseason workouts were, were absolutely nuts i mean i don't think there's ever a workout that i've done with him that was any harder than anywhere else i've ever been i mean his his preseason even his in-season workouts were were insane um i mean for him his warm-up and drill were like an hour and a half <laughs> just because he 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 would drill and drill just the, the basics right i mean like coach i mean this we're an hour in we're still going over head and hand position but again he, he was so technically sound that that's what he wanted to work on you know to make sure that the fundamentals were there you know if you can't get your you know head and hands down or head in a certain position well 
maybe we shouldn't be moving on to a double leg. <laughs> so <laughs> and this the, is a room know, of college guys. Yeah, these are room of college guys. Yeah, I mean, he would go over things that you'd learn when you're seven years old, which was good because there's things that you didn't learn correctly as a seven-year-old where you should be learning as a 21-year-old. So right. it's, I mean, hey, yeah, his preparation for match readiness was, was second to none. Was Kale's approach yeah. big difference when he became head coach? Kale, Kale's approach was different, but it was similar, right? I think Kale learned things from other coaches the, the right way and, and the wrong way to do things or what to do and what not to do. He was a bit more, um, uh, well, feeling good, right? I mean, there was Bobby. I mean, he, he got you ready, he made sure you're ready, but then Kale almost took it one step further back to make sure well, you need another day off. You know, it's almost like, well, I feel like I need to get on the mat. It's like, no, you need to take a day off. You know, so it was just like, he he knows how to get you ready. I mean, I think just because of just experience, you know, um, and that's why his guys always seem like they're peaking at the right right time. You know, and for Bobby Douglas, say, feeling good wasn't on the radar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, his feeling good's different. I mean, maybe he's just older, right? Older school. Um, it's almost like, you know, we trained through some things and trained through a lot of um, dual meets, but with Kale, it's almost like, you know, okay, you're taking Wednesday off. It was Wednesday off was every day in the preseason. You know, we left and like, okay, I don't want to see you back until Thursday afternoon. You know, I just made sure that, you know, your body is, is uh, recovered, you know, and not on the verge of, of uh, maybe failure or injury. Yeah especially when you're seven months out from the nationals, I think about how long the season is sometimes yeah. it's like, Oh my gosh, September, yeah. October workouts. It's like, oof. yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about it, it's really a 12 month cycle. I mean, you know, starting the day after NCAAs, right. So really your, your training cycle starts day after NCAAs and then following it until you leave maybe for summer break. So you're still cross training. But when a lot of coaches are I mean, they're training from August, right? When you step on the on on campus, and you're doing hard, you know, preseason training, a lot of runs, um, weightlifting, and then once you're on the mat in October, it's you're full bore. So you yeah. you got to be, you got to be obviously smart. I mean, coach the good coaches and coaching staffs, they're the ones who evolve with time. Um, and just kind of read the, you know, read the certain individual, right? I mean, your 25 pounder is different than your 84 pounder or heavyweights different than your 33, you know? Right. So it's just reading your guys and making sure, okay, is November really that important um, than what we're trying to do in March? You know, if you look at, if you look at evolution, I mean, how just, just totally looking from the outside, looking in, you know, knowing what you know about Kale when you were first at Iowa state, what do you think has been some of the big change points for him, if anything, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years that's got Penn State to where they're at? Yeah, I just think it's it's the um, the, the daily development. You know, everyone works hard, right? Everybody in college works hard. Everyone's in shape. Everyone's strong. Everyone's good. But it's a matter of, you know, the making that individual believe they're good and having an individual really entrust in your coaching staff and what they're trying to do. It's like if you tell a kid, well, you need to drill for 20 minutes and get out of here. They're like, oh, shit. Well, I don't know if I'll be ready. It's like, no, you'll feel better. You know, so it's really they do a good job of, of relaying why, right, you know, why you're taking taking off instead of, you know, you need to keep drilling or you need to keep going because you'll get better. Sometimes getting better is just going home and and, uh, you know going to get a hot meal and taking a shower and going to bed. You know, I don't know. It's just, yeah, they do a good, a good job of kind of pulling you back um, from training. I mean, there's some times where, you know, uh, Nick Fanthorpe. Oh yeah. Illinois kid, right. He was probably one of the hardest working kids I've ever seen. He would work out, you know, two, three times a day. And finally Cody and Kale were like, Nick, you got to stop. You know I mean? You got to stop because, you know, he just got so worn down. And a lot of times, you know, bodies and mentally, by the time March rolls around, you know, you're shot. I mean, obviously the best, right? I mean, the best find ways to peak in Valley, right? Um, peak at the right time, peak, you know, 
on Saturdays and Fridays. It's not always about, you know, training seven days a week. It's finding that good rhythm of, of uh, rest and, and recovery. And then also peaking during that, during dual meets and tournaments. Yeah. So he was a prime example of where he, they would just kick him out of the room, you know, and Zabriskie, same guy, right? I mean, he would just train and train and train, but you know, he was the type of guy that needed to put the weight on. Ed Bannock, right? Another story. I'm sure you heard a story of Gable, right? Gable would say, hey, he needs to get bigger and stronger. And everyone's like, yeah, get him out of here. Go put him in the weight room. So it's you got to read people differently. And that's what I think Kale does and Cody and, and, and goes guys. They do a good job of reading the individual. You know, the philosophy is not different. Just the individual and how maybe we got to train them differently mm-hmm. is. And to think that you and, and Kale and all the guys on your team got that historical download from Bobby Douglas, who, you know, like, like kept Gable off the world team in 1970. I mean, he was yep. going right to the, right to the wire. I mean, and smoked Gable, I think every time they wrestled. And then, you know, then he goes into coaching and takes Arizona state to a national title in the eighties. It's like, man, that is just such an incredible background to have Buxton and then Bobby Douglas as your foundation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Ernie Monaco um, was one of the guys that I actually started um, training with when I was younger. So Ernie Monaco from the edge, um, you know, the godfather of club wrestling, probably one of the most um, humble coaches I've ever been around. Um, he wasn't in it for right. Just notoriety. And, and here's all my athletes I coach. I mean, the guy was a, a probably one of the best or is one of the best technicians and, and tacticians of, of our time. Uh, does again get enough uh, kudos for it. But yeah, you go from Ernie Monaco and you go, yeah, Jeff Bucks and Blair places and, and uh, people I've been around, you know, not only as it coaches, but also wrestlers learn it from. Yeah. And yeah, going to Iowa state with Bobby and Bono and Kale and Cody. Um, it was Zach Thompson was, I'd roll around with him every day. You know, a lot of these guys. And then, and then Missouri with Smith and Askren and Sean Charles and Lee Pritz. Um, and obviously Brian Smith was head coach. Um, and then, yeah, went to Virginia Tech with Tony Roby, dresser, uh, Nate Yetzer. Um, and then, yeah, Iowa. I mean, you go to Iowa. I mean, Man. You, you've earned your – I mean, Iowa, you've earned your, your – um, I consider it my grad school. Yeah. You know, because it's – you know, people go to school for getting an MBA. Well, I went to Iowa to get my MBA. Not a business, but I got my, my, my grad school there. I'm just learning, you know, from some of the best uh, – and and I was, I mean, there's no place like it. I mean, you could probably say Penn State too, but no, it, Iowa City is the place is special. They love the wrestling. Hard to compare anything to it. Um, the the uh, support in Iowa City. That's one thing that I saw, and it really opened my eyes. Was like, no wonder why this team is is always good. The support they have when it comes to boosters and alumni around workout partners, it's, it's, that's why they're hard to beat is support. Even compared yeah. to Ames. Yeah. Even compared to Ames. Wow. Bobby Douglas, I think again, not to knock us alumni, but we don't support the team enough. And Bobby Douglas didn't have the support that say like, you know, Iowa had. He didn't have the full full support of, of the alumni uh, at Iowa State. Um, just not enough money coming in, not enough support from from the the alumni. And if he did, maybe that would be a different story. But yeah, I mean, if he didn't have 100 percent support from every everybody in every angle, maybe he could have taken out Iowa. Who knows? But you know, doing what he did with um, the teams he had, pretty damn impressive. Yeah, definitely. And I, I can imagine back in the day, you know, when Gibbons stepped down, they brought a non Iowa State guy and there was probably a lot of a lot of shake up about that. You know, could, just, yeah. you know, yeah, could be could have been a lot of shake up, could have been a lot of, you know, you know, why is an outsider come in? You know, Oklahoma State Cowboy. So, I mean, Douglas was uh, yeah. in Stillwater. So maybe that was a little bit it. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, different. It was a shake up. But still, again, the, the teams he, he had and coming close to knocking Iowa off five or six times you know it's um it was right there you know maybe you get it back to where it needs to be again yeah and we're seeing Kevin Dresser do that now we were talking about it before we got into the show it's so exciting the Iowa State Cyclones are back you well, know they won the regular season big 12 
Not that that's, you know, no one's, no one's yeah. partying for that, but Hey, they could win the big 12s. And that's, that's a big, yeah. big step. And uh, you, you said you worked with dresser out at Virginia tech, obviously. And yep. a lot of people say he was like the governor of Virginia, man. No one thought he would leave. Then he goes to Iowa state. What was dresser like back in the, uh, back in the VT days? I mean, dresser was, so he went to Grundy, Virginia, which is in like Southwest Virginia, right? I mean, a place where, you know, you would think coaches and wrestlers would, would go to die, but no, he, he came there, found a way to win. I mean, I don't know how many state titles he won in, Gr- in Grundy, Virginia. I'm pretty sure it's in Grundy. Maybe I'm thinking <laughs> it's different. But they went then to the Heron and went to Christiansburg, which is right next to Blacksburg. And they went there and he, he won how many state titles there. He had a, a bingo night every week, bingo night at the, the Christiansburg, um, I think it's like the, the hall there. And that's how he would, you know, fundraise. He would fundraise a ton of money. It was just bingo. I mean, that's a pretty smart way to do it. And then he would help out with travel and everything for the teams. And then, yeah, when Virginia Tech opened up, he was obviously the obvious hire for it. And then, yeah, I brought Virginia Tech to, I don't know how many um, All-Americans he, he had. And, uh, well, with Makai Lewis, and he recruited him. Mm-hmm. So he, he had pretty darn good before, right before, right? I think it was right after he left, Lewis won it with uh, Roby at the helm. Yeah. So yeah, he he does he does a fantastic job of like I said putting the right pieces in, and right people around him um, to win. I mean he's, I've said I've you know it's not obvious, but he's probably one of the best kind of wrestling CEOs, right? Um, manager, you know I think he he lets his assistants coach right. He's got Metcalf and St. John in there running the practices, and he does a great job of of getting everyone else back in alumni support boosters and so he, he's the right guy for the job and then coming back right it took him what four or five years and he he lost one dual meet this year and i think at the last time iowa state lost one dual meet was i think i just saw a thing on twitter it was like in the late 90s right i mean that's wow. pretty damn impressive yeah so yeah i mean dual meets aren't you know dual meet record right it's not important but I mean, if you have, obviously you're winning, right? The guys believe it. And now I think they've seen it. So now going into big 12s and good catapult, right? And then we got the car and everyone else around them. They're doing good. So if you look, I'm glad you brought up the wrestling CEO title because that's something I'm, I'm pretty interested in. So when you look at D1 program coaches, except for like Penn State and Iowa, where the support's going to be there no matter what, the money's going to be there no matter what, maybe even include Oklahoma State, if you're at any of these programs besides those top three, do you think the head coaches should should be more in that CEO role where they're like either glad handle and they're 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 building relationships and having other people run the practice? Um, or is it all just dependent on who the coach is? I mean, yes. Uh, I mean, here's the thing about wrestling is right, we, we put the people in place in these positions where if you if you haven't won a you know world Olympic title where you're probably not gonna get a good shot at these top positions. So I think the best thing to do is, yeah, I mean, you got to bring the assistants in who know what they're doing when it comes to not only coaching from three to five, but you got to know what you're doing outside of the, the, the practice room. So being a CEO, you got to manage everyone you know, below you, right? Give them the tools to manage. And here's my expectations for you. Um, now, you here's your guys, here's your guys, here's your guys, bring them along. Right? I remember at Iowa, Tom Branch is like, you want to coach? Yeah, I do. All right, let's go coach. So I'm like, okay, where are we going? Say, well, we're going to see what Matt McDonough is having for lunch. I'm like, hey, we're going to go see what we're having for lunch? Yeah. We got to make sure he's eating the right things, make sure he's going to, to school, to class. I mean, Matt McDonough, right? I mean, a, a guy that, I mean, he, he can <laughs> handle his own stuff, but still, I mean, so it's not only – coaching right it's it's, you're not just coaching from three to five right i mean that's easy anyone Mm -hmm. can do that it's really outside that time where you got to make sure these you know guys are out out of the bars they're getting their work done they're in study hall and they're not you know screwing off so yeah i mean being a ceo is you're just not i'm just not the you know x's and o's guys and here's how to do a tight waist ride it's you know, you got to go out and recruit and, um, 
go out and talk to the community and get your alumni back. You know, it's, um, again, I hate bringing Iowa back up again, but I just, I know what they're doing is, you know, they, they found the, um, the building that they're, they're um, going to be uh, putting up is that was all fundraised by onesie twosie stuff. Isn't it wasn't crazy? just like, I mean, it was all onesie twosie stuff. So it wasn't just like, you know, maybe 10 big boosters. No, it was like a hundred, right? So it was a hundreds of boosters. So it's, it's the numbers. It's not just relying on one or two guys where one year they might just be like, you know what? I can't do it this year. And then there, there goes your, your whole year of, of travel or a whole year of uh, budget. So you got to rely on hundreds of guys or girls and bringing them back in the fold. Like, Hey, you know, give what you can get, even if it's 50 bucks or five bucks, you know, instead of just, you know, relying on, you know, I got a guy who gives 20,000 a year, but you know, what if that guy like this year, right. Or past couple of years where it hit them hard. Right. So it's yeah, just going out and making sure that you're bringing everybody back in the fold and, and, you know, getting them excited about supporting again. Yeah, and you look back during Gable's era, Roy Carver said, I want to be the only donor to the Hawkeye Wrestling Club. So Gable had yeah. no fundraising to do, and he couldn't right. because Roy Carver said no, and then you know things are a lot different now. Um, so let's talk about Iowa because there's not many Iowa State wrestlers who went on to coach at Iowa, if any. And uh, and I'm just wondering how all that came about and what it was like inside uh, inside the, yeah. uh, the dark layer yeah. there. So there's only two guys that, that wrestled at Iowa State, and I went to coach at Iowa. It was myself and Gable. So I'm I'm <laughs> waiting on my I'm waiting on my presidential medal. <laughs> um, How could I forget that one? I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, of course. Of yeah. course, the great Gable. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm waiting on my medal to you know to be you know, <laughs> around my neck. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, again, it was just one of those things where you know I was at Virginia Tech, right? My wife was look. My wife's from Iowa. So she was looking to get back, back home. I don't, I think I couldn't blame her. I could live anywhere. Right. I mean, I was out of the house when I was 13 years old. So, I mean, I can live in, you know, mm-hmm. Southern Russia. And um, so, you know, I was calling around and called Buxton. Buxton was very friendly with Tom at the time, um, traveling, coaching with him. And he's like, you know, why don't you, what about Iowa? I'm like, you know, at the time when you graduate from Iowa state, you know, I was the enemy. Um, I'm like, no way, you know, but at that point, it's like, well, it's, it's Iowa wrestling. Um, it would be a great place to learn. Uh, I'm always intrigued about what's going on within their program. And uh, I was like, no way. So I, you know, I was like, yeah, see what he thinks. So he's like, yeah, um, Tom Brands called. He's like, why don't you fly up this weekend? So we went up, worked out, um, worked out a couple of times. I think it was more or less just kind of a, let's see if this kid can still scrap, you know, I was what, 28 years old and kind of had a little bit of uh, off the competing, but still, obviously you got that old man strength. So, you know, I was putting on some guys and yeah, one thing led to another offered me a job and there it was, you know, was there for three years and it was, yeah, it was unbelievable. All in that same weekend, all the offer and everything came about. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was that same weekend, but I think it was pretty much shortly after, you know, we, you know, hit it off pretty well. Um, you know, Tom Brands is, is a guy that, you know, you can't bullshit him, right? I mean, he's a, he's a pretty cunning person. Um, so it's what you see is what you get. And, you know, he's honest, honest man. And yeah, he's just a few days later, I think, yeah, he's like, Hey, we want to bring on an assistant. And when can you, when can you move up? I'm like, well, now, you know, and, moved up from Blacksburg to Iowa city and there we have it. So yeah. those workouts, was he putting you through it? Like, like a workout or you're just kind of going along coaching some guys and he's observing. No, it was a, it was a, it was a uh, Hawkeye wrestling club practice. So I was wrestling like one of the heavyweights there. Um, can't remember his name. I don't think he wrestled Iowa. Um, but yeah, we were, I mean, he was a heavyweight and I was, you know, quite a bit lighter, but still we were, we were scrapping and yeah, did a whole practice. Um, you know, met everybody. And, uh, you know, I think some people just couldn't believe that, oh, you know, an outsider, you know, comes into the program because not many people do mm-hmm. um, come from outside in. You know, I think you know, Jared Frayer was um, 
he was there one time. I know Tim Hartung was there one time. He was a he was a gopher. I went there, but yeah, not many not many people outside of the Hawkeye wrestling program go and coach there. Yeah. So I mean, it's a, it's a lot like anywhere else, right? I mean, they kind of hire work from within, but they're extremely, you know stiff arm when it comes to bringing other people in especially a cyclone especially i mean i'm thinking uh, back to all the the coaches they've had the only one i could think of outside of the few you mentioned is you know jay robinson was from okie state gable brought mm-hmm. him in and he you know he was the uh the right hand man he was yeah. running the show so yeah we've seen it happen but it's rare and and obviously you get in there one of the things i was just dying to ask you is what are you what are some of your impressions like a year into it two years into it like of how maybe different it is or, or what's going on in there, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought those, those guys were, were nuts, right? I mean, the first several months I was there, right. I mean, a good way they're fanatics, right. I mean, they, they wrestling and family are their two, right. They're, they're two main focuses. And, um, you know, they remember this one time, I mean, you hear Tom Brand speak, you, you think he's kidding, right. I mean, he, he does a lot of analogies and, and I, I remember he was talking to his team every day before practice, about a half hour, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, he would talk to his team, get them ready, and they would go out and warm up and get and go. And a lot of, he would tell them, you know, stories and, you know, good storyteller, right? A good leader is a good storyteller. And he would, you know, do a lot of these analogies. And I would, like, be cracking up because, I mean, these can't be true. I mean, what he's saying is just, you know, it's just out of this world. And I'm like, no, this guy is real. I mean, so he, he, what he says is real and he, it comes from, uh, you know, uh, from the heart, but it's like, but the first couple of months, I'm like, man, th- these guys are crazy, crazy in a good way. Right. I mean, I practices, I'd show up at 6am and they've already been there for like two hours. Right. I think, you know, <laughs> they might've wo- you know, woken up at four o'clock and done an air dine and sawn it already. And they're <laughs> already got their guys, you know, drilling for uh individual practice so yeah i mean um were there any speeches or workouts that stick out to you you're like we're really in the thick of it now or we're uh you know we're into it yeah i mean i wouldn't say anything stuck out to me um because they're all think pretty run you know they uh, mix together um i remember this we wrestled it was the first year so we had a pretty young team like ramos and st john Telford, Mike Evans, Josh Jeva, you know, young guys. Uh, my first year, uh, I think we wrestled, it had to be Indiana, Purdue, right? So we're in Carver, we just beat him, but it was just, wasn't great, right? It wasn't a great performance. And he's like, you know, you guys got to get tough. And he, he just ripped his shirt, you know, button down, <laughs> all the way off, buttons go flying. And then he walks out. I'm like, again, that's real. That's him, right? I mean, because he's, you know, fired up. I mean, what he feels and, and uh, he did, he did another time too, and on like an I club, but again, that's just him, right? I mean, his emotions and it's uh, comes from inside, and it's like I said, it's it's what you see is what you get. Yeah, the few times I've been around him, it's just like his unwillingness to compromise on any standard. He's just like there's no choices throughout the day for him. Like, hey, I'm I'm debating what time I'm waking up. I wake up at four thirty. Do I stay up? You know, do I yeah. do I keep yeah. doing this or that? He's just so. They just doesn't, they don't seem like they have that internal conflict and dialogue. They just do it. No, very principled, very principled people. You know, I think uh, they have a certain philosophy and yeah, they're not going to veer off it because somebody else thinks it's wrong. Um, You know, it's, they have a certain philosophy and and coaching style. Um, It's obviously it's work, right? Um, But yeah, I mean, you're not going to tell them otherwise that, you know, Obviously, what works for them, it's, you know, it's the Gable philosophy too, right? It comes from that, but also comes from their experience and what, what's worked for them. So, obviously, yeah, I mean, they won a national title last year. And, well, year before that, they, it's a COVID year. So, has put some good teams together. You know, basically, but two-time defending champs. Yeah, super consistent. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing about them, they're they're extremely consistent people, right? I mean – their effort, right? They're always, they're always there. You know, they're going to give you your full effort. They're consistent individuals when it comes to all facets of life. So it's, you know, you, you know, you can rely on them for uh, their, their coaching expertise and help. Yeah. What a, uh, just what an experience it must've been for you being there, learning, you know, working with those guys, bumping elbows, and then 
you know, a couple years later, you make the jump from wrestling, 24 years in wrestling to the business world. And uh, now you're in a sales, sales capacity, uh, mortgage professional, but what, uh, what fears and trepidations did you have making the leap into the business world after, you know, having a life in wrestling? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was different, right? I mean, tw- I was I graduated, I graduated, but I retired from wrestling and coaching uh, when I was 30 years old. So 30 years old, you're like, man, that's, that's a lifetime, right? I mean, uh, but I feel like I was ready to take a, a different position when it comes to family and, and uh, using such as my uh, major like finance right so i got into the um, mortgage um, mortgage lending world i uh, went to wells fargo um, a lot of because reason why wells fargo is good like nate gallic nate gallic mitch mueller dylan long um, a lot of those guys were there and that's where they got all their experience from so went there for uh, five years and now i'm out in um, in the market one of the largest um, credit unions in the um, in the state of iowa and actually, we were growing into Illinois. You might see them, Green State Credit Union. So you might might see some around you as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, it's just betting on yourself, right? I mean, you can stick in a you know a salaried position or in in wrestling, but a lot of think a lot of times people hang on too long. You know, I mean, I think people should st- they stay in a position too long because it's just comfortable, and. You know, it just wasn't enjoyable for me anymore. Um, wanted to just spend more time with family. And, um, and in Iowa, right? I mean, Iowa, it's, it's, you're going. I mean, you're going from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., you know, every day, besides maybe August. Every weekend. Like, you're not around many weekend. weekends, right? No. I mean, you're, you're going, you know, because that's what I expect. And that's, you know, it's to win at a high level in Division One. you're always on. Right. I mean, you're recruiting, you got kids on campus, you're, you know, you're out freestyle, you're, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're making these Michigan swings, you're going to Lansing, you're going to um, Ann Arbor, you're going to Illinois and Indiana, like, you know, big 10 swings, right? You're gone from Thursday to Monday, right? And so then you're back and then, so it gets long, right? I just wasn't in it, in it uh, for the right reasons anymore. So I'm like, you know, I don't want to, take away from the art right of, of wrestling and why it did it and yeah. so now i'm coaching my kids i'm coaching my kids and bringing them along to try to get them going along the right way and so yeah you kind of bet on yourself and bet on your experience when it comes to just people and and uh yeah hitting goals right i mean it's yeah. it's been fun it's life-changing actually yeah it's the best best part about it a commission-based job i'm in software sales outside sales and I've had Gallic on. I, I love Gallic, and I'm, I'm sure what you're doing is is similar, commission based sales structure, yep. kind of. 100 percent commission. I wouldn't want it other way. 100. Right? percent I mean, Let's go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You're, I love that. Commission. Yeah. You know, what I mean, parallels you get do you, what you put in? Exactly. I was gonna say, what parallels do you see between like structuring your day and your year and like your months from what you're doing now to wrestling? Yeah. I mean. You know, I've, I've seen, I, I'm on Twitter a lot, right? I mean, you see a lot of um, people on there. And I, th- I think one of the people, one guy is really good at explaining it. To, and the current, you know, market is you work like an athlete, right? I mean, you, you get up, you, you might work hard for a couple hours and then, you know, I don't know go work out, right? And then mm-hmm. you get back on the phone, work hard for another couple hours. And then go home. And then I'm, I'm working, right? I mean, 100% commission. You don't, you're not clock in, clock out. You work when you have to. When you do. Yeah, and that's that's just the, you know, a lot of the ways to think about the day and how why it's so much more fun. I mean, look at the autonomy and freedom you have. And and obviously, you know, what no one really talks about is is the money's damn good, and uh, it's a lot of fun to do it. So it's I just encourage everyone to to check out a commission based job if possible. Sales, you know, being one of them. Um, yeah. and I thought, I thought, you know, I just looking at your Twitter, I could tell you were that kind of guy, a Ryan holiday guy, a Jocko Willink guy. I mean, that, that's, that's some of my weekly reading. Yeah. Um, yeah, no commission, but I would say any, any athlete should be, should not be afraid of a commission based position. Right. Cause again, it's, you know, if you want to make X, then you're more likely going to make X or more. Mm-hmm. 
right? I mean, just like athletics, right? Nothing's guaranteed in athletics, um, especially wrestling, right? I mean, nothing's getting, it's not guaranteed you're going to get your hand raised because you know, you know what goes into getting your hand raised is not just showing up. It's putting the, the belief and, and visualization and work in um, nights, weekends, um, laying down before you go to bed. I mean, just, yeah, just seeing it and believing it. And it's, there's a lot of, I'm not saying, I'm not thinking anxiety is the right word for it, right? Or just constant um, thinking about it. I mean, you're thinking about um, wrestling. I still think about it. I'm sure you do too, right? Mm-hmm. It's something that you always think about. And the same thing with your job. You're always thinking about it, how to get better. Uh, what you can do differently and that's what makes it that's what makes it sweet right it's not just oh man i don't have to worry about my job because you never know right nothing's guaranteed right right and are you to the point now where you're managing people or are you still still running solo so i was i was um managing um but even that i just decided you know what um i just became a kind of a expensive babysitter right so um now i'm just relying on myself Right. I got a, an assistant that, yeah, we just drive in the business and help people get into homes. So it's, it's awesome. Love it. Love it. Love it, man. Yeah. Since, awesome. yeah since it's a change yeah, four years ago, it's been, yeah, it's definitely been life, life changing for sure. And when you look at your, your daily routine, I'm guessing you're still working out cause you're looking, you're looking pretty fit right yeah. now. What, what, how, when do you get that in and what does that look like for you on a weekly basis? So literally I live in uh, a mile from my house. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, excuse me, no, I'm <laughs> from a mile from my work. So literally I live a mile from where I work, right? So get up, right, get the kids ready to school, get them out the door. And then, yeah, I go to work for a few hours, right, from 8 to 11, go home for lunch, work out for an hour, you know, hour and a half, and then he- head back in, right, and then finish the day up. So I usually get in around lunchtime. Um, that's just I, I, how I feel. I feel better that way. A lot of guys are the morning people, right? You know, the 5 a.m. club. They used to do it all the time. I uh, decided, well, shoot, I don't have to drive to work anymore. Um, when I used to work at Wells, it would be, you know, I, I got an hour back in my day. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do it over the lunch hour. Um, I just feel like it fits better. Right? Mm-hmm. I feel better. Um, I feel like I get, I get a better workout. And I just, yeah, that's how I do it. Do it during the lunch hour and get it in and come back in. The second half of the day feels so much better that way, doesn't it? Yeah. You're yeah, recharged. Yep. Recharged. I mean, I, I couldn't get through the day without working out. It's it's my anchor. Mm-hmm. Right. I, it's, I feel better. I'm not cranky. I tell my wife all the time, I just need to go work out. You know, you got to work out in. I got Aerodyne in my basement, a sauna, um, rings, pull-up bar. I mean, probably a couple thousand pounds of, of of, of weights and dumbbells and, and barbells so it's it's awesome Dang. you know I, I used to be I used to be the gym guy but you know you you, you uh meet too many people in the gym and they just talk a year off <laughs> you know? yeah and uh, i just like to suffer in silence man you know <laughs> plus like like you said with kids like you know you start having that environment every minute's precious right so if you can carve off yep. the 45 minutes of, of fluff that's added on to the pre during and post of going to the gym and the sauna in the yeah. basement, such a that's a life goal right there. That's awesome. Oh. Yeah, I mean it's not big, right? I mean, I got actually got in a pretty bad situation. I was when I was leaving Iowa City, my neighbor was getting divorced. So I took I took advantage, was like, hey dude, just just go just take the sauna. I'm like, okay. So I was down in his basement unscrewing a sauna with his ex soon to be ex-wife and her parents and it was very uncomfortable but i was oh. like i'm getting this damn i'm getting this damn sauna out of here <laughs> <laughs> so you know it was like a thousand couple thousand dollar sauna but he didn't want it or he she didn't want it nor could he move it because he was you know moving into like a town home so you know thing gets hot you know older sauna but shoot thing thing works like a charm you know, wow. work out. Yeah. I turn it on, work out and go in there and it's yeah, saunas are, are anyone's best friend, especially a wrestler. Yeah. That's uh, as soon as I get a house, I'm bringing it back. I, I showed TJ Seabolt came on and he was talking about a guy who custom built his. And so I called the guy, I'm like, can you put one in my closet? He's like, how big's your closet? I'm like two by two. He's like, 
<laughs> what? Yeah. It's like, dude, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't even fit the, uh, the heater in that. So uh, yeah, the either, guy, yeah. I just cold called the guy in middle of Iowa. He was uh, totally taken back, but um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I could put a seat on your heater for you yeah, that's <laughs> <small> for sure. <laughs> Well, as we, uh, as we wind down, I just, I know you're such a fan of wrestling. You follow it like crazy. We're witnessing one of the great seasons ever by a couple guys. Everyone talks about Gable. Yanni's doing his thing, but a lot of people, a lot of people don't talk about David Carr and just how, how yeah. deadly he is this year. I mean, I think yeah. he's like yeah. 50 some in a row. I mean, what have you seen with that guy and what do you expect from him against Deacon at the NCAAs? You know, he's special, right? I mean, Carr is one of those kids where, you know, it's definitely a, a program changer, right? I mean, he, he does it the right way. Not a bad word, to, you know, thing to say about him because he's he's a team he's a team guy, right? He wants everyone to do well around him. Um, positive family is, is incredible. His parents, right? I mean, we all know his father. But the, the family himself, I mean, he's won, what, 51 straight? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I think I said something about the other day where 100 wins in college isn't um, isn't, uh, you know, celebrated enough. But this dude has won 51 straight. Right. <laughs> Hasn't lost 51 yeah. matches. So, it's you know, that, that's impressive in itself. And yeah, and then Gable, I mean, Gable's a whole nother level. Right. I mean, the guy's an Olympic champ and he just I think he was like, yeah, now now it's time to turn it on. I'm like, well, this guy's <laughs> been operating at what half, half capacity. And then just like Tekken fools, I mean that's scary, right? I mean, yeah, he's he's really impressed me. Obviously, just you know the way he moves, and the guy moves like a you know forty nine pounder being a full blown heavyweight, right? I mean, he's special in itself. I mean, he he's definitely gonna help wrestling and our you know lens of where you know how we're looked upon, I guess, right? Yeah, his next step. I mean, look about look at how much better he's gotten in folk style from this year to last year. Yeah. And I can't imagine he was putting any focus on folk style this summer. Like it, do, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. He how good he is. I mean, no. it does, but it's like his levels. He's jumped levels again. Yeah, that's that's one guy where I yeah I wouldn't want to wouldn't want to have to <laughs> go across from right. I mean, but he's yeah he's definitely a beast for sure. It's, it's awesome. And yeah. last last one I'll ask you about is uh, you know, Big Twelve tournament. That's never been, you know, being a middle, you know, middle Illinois guy, big tens, what we're, what we're accustomed yeah. to. You're a big 12 guy. Tell us about, you know, a little big 12 preview going into it this year. Um, you know, yeah. Iowa state's dual favorites, but how's it looking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, down in Tulsa, um, obviously Iowa state is a uh, big 12. I'm, I'm pretty sure pre pre or preseason big 12 champs, right. Didn't lose. I think, but yeah, going into big 12s, you know, conference tournament, right never going to easy tournament it's like you know similar to big tens where everyone's everyone's showing up to scrap right i mean i'm sure okie state's pissed right i mean they're, they're not where they would need to be you and i as well um and but then you also have right i think missouri's back in missouri's they're tough back in the, yeah they're, in the big are they 12. back in right they're the big 12 yeah. again missouri's always always tough brian smith knows how to get his guys ready i mean wyoming's always tough i mean south dakota state han's doing an awesome job so you got all these guys that, you know, I mean, obviously Branch and, you know, I think he's doing a fantastic job too. So, I mean, you got, you know, six, eight teams that are always, they're going to show up ready to go mm-hmm. in, in a couple of weeks. So, but again, right, I got to give it to Iowa State, right? They're, you know, right in my backyard, alumni, and um, they look ready. I mean, they, they look like they're on the, you know, upper right trajectory of, of where they need to be. But, yeah, I mean, you just got to be ready to go. I mean, all these teams are just, uh, you know, it's good. It's good for wrestling. It's good for the Big 12. And it's just good for the growth, right? I mean, you want everyone scrapping. You want everyone excited about it, not just a handful of teams. We right. need everybody coming up, right? You know, high tide lifts all ships, and that's what we need. You know, everyone, everyone growing, everyone hitting on all cylinders for sure. Yeah, Missouri back in the Big 12 is awesome. You and I, you know, obviously Schwab's had them going for the better part of a decade, but they're they're a threat. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. and just knowing your experience with Division One wrestling, are the teams knowing that we have like a two week break this week and everyone's off basically, and then next weekend is the t- conference. Yeah. Are they taking off Monday and Tuesday of this week, or are they going hard Monday and Tuesday of this week? This this week and part of so what is it? They wrestle March was it third or fifth? 
these next two weeks are probably two of the most important weeks of, of the whole year prior to big, you know, the, the conference tournament. Uh, I wouldn't say they're taking off, but I think it's, it's those, you know, you can really put in 10 good days of, of uh, training, you know, honing, you know, um, polishing the skills, you know, if you're on a, a bad losing, well, Hey, you, you know, you're starting from zero, right? Everyone's zero, zero. So it's, everyone's went back to zero. I mean, you can make the NCAA tournament, even if you're, you know, 0 and 25. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those things where, yeah, I mean, these next couple of weeks are two of the most important uh, time, two of the most important weeks in, in the whole year. Yeah. And just getting for preparation. Yeah. Physical, but also the mental has got to be everything at this yep. point. I mean, getting yep, yourself everything. ready. Yeah. Cause right now, like I said, people either can go up or go down and, and physically or mentally, but it, it's, it's those first, those two weeks that you can really prepare, um, you know, a ton. You can get a ton better in the next two weeks. And those two weeks, obviously, between it's a blaze, that's really just, you know, and yeah, it's not as important, but these before the conference tournament are extremely important just because you got to get people qualified. Yeah. And you if know? you're, if you're a coach, are you turning it up like Wednesday through Tuesday and then toning it down and kind of letting them heal up right now? Yeah. I mean, really? So you can put in probably, you know, uh, three, three, uh, three day blocks of training, right. Where you're, you know, you might bring in a, a masseuse a couple of times where, you know, you're getting massages and you're getting some good heavy lifts in. Um, but yeah, you might put in, you know, a few, you know, two a days, but yeah, you know, just having a good training cycle, right. I mean, cause today's what Monday, right. I'm assuming, teams might be off right or they might have a good lift in but like tuesday wednesday thursday and friday this week you put a ton of just one-on-one individuals right and then having you know saturday sunday and then yeah monday tuesday wednesday next week you can put another good training cycle in and then yeah. you probably leave them for the conference tournament right on wednesday thursday so you could put a good you know seven to ten days in of, of good preparation and and rest and yeah, just uh, feeling good to get better. Yeah, man, you're getting me yeah. excited just thinking about it. The tapering and man, next yeah, this weekend's gonna it's be a painful. Science, man. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's a it's a science. I mean a lot of I mean you really got to work way your way back, right? I mean okay, top of the tournament is Saturday Sunday or Friday Saturday. Um, so let's work our way back. You know you can put in all right Thursday to travel day, but like Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, Saturday, and you could put in how many days of of mm-hmm. good smart uh, preparation. I mean, if that looks like you know lift, drill, afternoon, you're putting in two hours, an hour and a half max of of come in. You know, you go in three tough matches and then you know go hop in the cold plunge, right? I mean, it's a science. I mean, it's just you got to work hard. You got to be smart about it, and you got to read your guys, right? Because you know some kids can go one way, and some kids kids can go the other way fast. Yeah, it's like and, uh, it's such a time, like a, a big gap of time for the mind to play tricks yep. on you. You know, you're not having that weekly gauger yep. of like duels and tournaments to remind you. You can get in a weird spot in those two weeks. Yep. Yep. And then really like nutrition and, and making sure kids are eating and drinking. It's like, you know, remember one year, you know, Tom was like, here, here's a P card, right? Your procurement card. You take Mike Evans out and, um, you know, pick up, you know, I don't know, pick up some food for him and, and the team, right? Because it's like we need to keep him good nutrition, right? So you're, you're sometimes you're paying out of uh, uh, your pocket or sometimes you're making sure they got food in their fridge. And it's just, yeah, just a crazy time to um, get these kids feeling good. Because a lot of times, you know, they might just go and get a Subway sandwich. But it's like, no, you need like a good meal, you know, a good meal and, you know, um, water Gatorade and a, and a protein shake, you know, yeah. kids, kids don't know how to take care of themselves. Right. I mean, they don't know how to eat. They don't know how to sleep. And, you know, they can just beat themselves up. Are the top programs having people cook meals for them yet or not yet? Not yet. But again, a lot of times, you know, if you, you know, you can um, make sure they're eating the right things and, you know, chicken, broccoli, and pasta, right. Easy, cheap. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, you know, it's something, but it's, you know, time consuming. They'd rather have a bowl of cereal, right? 
That Crazy. reminds you of Nick Fanthorpe again, right? I mean, no. big cereal guy. It was yeah. he? <laughs> yeah, big cereal guy. It's all you'd have. You know, it's like, Nick, you got to eat better, man. It's not just going to have cereal, <laughs> right? Jake Varner's roommate. You know, it's like, Jake would be like, yeah, I don't know why he just has like Cheerios. You know, and <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, but it's so true, though. It's like you're, you don't want to put in the time and like you just don't know any better. No. And bodies are so mm-hmm. resilient at that age. And yeah. Cereal, yeah, just, cereal. Yeah, you go home and go, you know, shop at Subway instead of, you know, make going home and making yourself some noodles and red sauce and, you know, chicken breast. It takes time, but it's, you know, like I said, it's a science. Yeah. Those little things make a huge difference day, day after day after day. Mm-hmm. You know, winning, you win in, in the monotony, right? You win in just like, you know, eating the same thing and, and training, right? It's just monotonous, but you got to, you know, find it in the monotony and last question are you thinking about if you're the coach of iowa state or iowa are you thinking about peaking for the ncaa's right now as well or is that kind of all out of your mind until after conference and you're only building to conference it's it's after conference because if you don't peak at conference then what is then so play if you're not going to even qualify right yeah so it's right right now it's peaking for conference conference is the next thing right i mean but if if you don't, if you know, say qualify, then what is March or what is the NCAA is even for? Because you didn't go. Because like I said, these next two weeks is the most important time of the year because you got to get to NCAA's, right? You got to get the best seed um, to put yourself in a position at NCAA's to to win it. Mm-hmm. To put yourself in position to all American get on the on the podium. So yeah, right now is. It's yeah, it's it's a fine line between you know pushing but pulling back and and making sure that every guy's feeling good when they go to conference because it's extremely important to get everybody there. Yeah, Kurt Backus, you like I said, you got me so excited for the postseason. I'm so uh, glad we got on here and we're able to yuck it up for an hour or so. Yeah, thank it was you awesome, so, man. It was thank awesome. you so much for coming on, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's an honor, man. I'm, I'm following you guys. I love what you do. Keep it up. Thank you, man. We'll see you around. Folks, this episode is brought to you by Quant Wrestling. Quant takes the Moneyball approach to the sport of wrestling. They have an app that's available on the Google and Apple Play stores where you can find all of their Division One wrestling data. They track 500-plus stats for each match, timestamp them, and then upload them into the Quant app. Really fantastic tool. Download it now at Quant Wrestling. On the Google and Apple Play stores, use the discount code WCML to get your first month free.